Let's go ahead and get started with the remarks. So hello everyone and welcome to the Pacific Council's webcast on US Taliban peace talks. My name is Mariah Tafoya and I'm a programs associate here at the Pacific Council. And we're so excited to have this group of experts together to discuss the state of talks between the United States and the Taliban. And also just to check in on how the terms have been progressing since the deal at the end of February. As a note for our audience, you'll be muted and your video will be turned off for the duration of the call, but we encourage you to participate by clicking on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to send in questions. We'll have about 15 minutes at the end there for to answer your questions, but please feel free to submit those at any point during the conversation in the box at the bottom. So thank you to all of our members and guests for joining today and I'll turn it over to our moderator, Mr. Thomas Zimmerman. Wonderful. Thank you, Mariah. Um, so as Mariah said, we're here today to talk about the, the current state of negotiations with the Taliban and perhaps more importantly, what comes next for Afghanistan. So we addressed this topic a bit ago, um, not long after the U.S. and Taliban signed an agreement in February, uh, under which the U.S. committed to withdrawing forces within 14 months. Um, since then, there's been starts and stops. Uh, and last week, President Ghani promised that we would soon have more information on what next steps in the intra-Afghan uh, negotiation process look like. So the questions we're sort of looking at here today are, if this process does advance, um, what are the range of possible outcomes uh, from this process and what are the potential barriers between here and there? Um, what does the U.S. role look like going forward in all this? And what can be done to prevent a, a steep erosion of the rights and protections uh, for Afghan uh, women and, and minority communities? So uh, for those of you I have not met, I'm, I'm Thomas Zimmerman. I'm going to be moderating this conversation. And I'm the programs director here at the Pacific Council. Uh, but in my prior life, I worked on the Pakistan desk at the Pentagon and then at the White House. Uh, and I lived and worked in Afghanistan in 2006 and 2007. Uh, we're joined here today by Shamila Kustani, a senior program officer at the Democracy Council, uh, also based here in Los Angeles, where she manages programs supporting gender rights and civil society in the Middle East and South Asia. Uh, she's long been a prominent advocate for human rights in Afghanistan and was also the former captain of the Afghan National Women's Football Team or soccer team uh, for us Yanks. Uh, we're also joined here by Barney Rubin, who is a senior fellow and associate director at the Center on International Cooperation. He's worked in Afghanistan for decades, uh, from 2009 to 2013. He was a senior advisor to the Special Representative of, on Afghanistan and Pakistan at the State Department. He also advised the United, Nation, United Nations Mission on Afghanistan during the crafting of the Afghan Constitution and the Afghan Compact. He was also uh, previously my boss, so it's particularly fun to have him here today. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Barney for a few remarks. If at any time during this conversation you have questions you'd like to pose, down at the bottom of your screen you'll see a little Q&A box. You can type those in. Once we get to the Q&A section, I will start posing those uh, to our panelists. Um, but uh, with that, Barney, I hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Thomas. Good to be with you and good to be with Shamila here. First thing I say is for the Americans, Americans often think of this war as being maybe about 20 years old since the United States first became involved. But actually, the war is older than Shamila. Uh, it, it, it started in 1978. Uh, it's 42 years old. Um, it's mid, kind of middle-aged, you know. And um, what's inter one interesting fact thing about the war, which really affects how the peace process will proceed, is that the rationale for the war the causes of the war, the reasons people give for fighting, have changed over time. It started because uh, of a communist regime that took power by a coup, then because of a Soviet invasion. Then the, so then the uh, regime was no longer communist. The Soviet Union dissolved, so theoretically there should be no reason to have the war anymore. But yet the war continued. It just turned into a different kind of war, uh, a sort of an ethnic factional conflict um, uh, we're in a country where people say there aren't any problems among the ethnic groups. And uh, then the Taliban arose and it became a fight over uh, who was going to control the country, uh, with north or south, with groups allied with Pakistan or Iran. 
then 9-11 happened and it became part of something new, the war on terrorism. Um, and now uh, we seem to have gotten tired of that. Terrorism has moved on uh, in many other, to many other places as well. And the United States is trying to get out. So um, I think, but what that shows very seriously is that the war is the result of some deeper phenomena in the region and not just of the reasons that people give for fighting at one time or another. I think it's important to bear in mind that in the past, uh, not just 40 years, but say 50 years or so, Afghanistan has been through numerous changes, not of government, but changes of regime. That is 50 years ago, Afghanistan was a monarchy as it had been for over 200 years. It was a monarchy ruled by more or less the same tribe as it had been for 200 years with a short interlude in 1929. Um, and then, since then, it became a republic uh, ruled by a strong man from the same tribe. Then it became a, dem a so-called democratic republic ruled by a communist party. Uh, then it was uh, it changed factions, a different faction of the party took over. Then that government uh, collapsed and it became so-called, uh, well, first the government itself, it went from being a democratic republic to just being a republic because it was trying to reform. Then the republic collapsed and it became an Islamic state ruled by the Mujahideen, which was hardly a state at all, never consolidated its power. Then the Taliban set up what they called their Islamic Emirate and the Islamic Emirate took over from the Islamic state. And then the United States overthrew the Islamic Emirate, and with the help of the United Nations, a group of Afghans established the interim administration of Afghanistan, then the transitional Islamic administration, and then the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. So that's seven or eight different uh, regimes, that, which means that actually the country has gone through a very revolutionary process where there is no real consensus about, not just about who will rule, but about what it means to rule, how you legitimate a government, what's the relationship of the state to the people. And uh, so all of those issues will in a way be on the table. And uh, what will happen now is the Taliban refused to talk to the government for many years saying that they first wanted to settle things with the United States, which had overthrown them and which was in control. Well, finally, the United States and the Taliban did reach an agreement on February 29. And as I understand it, the Taliban a delegation is supposed to meet with a delegation of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, not just the current government, but all the groups that support the constitution uh, in, in Doha, Qatar, uh, starting maybe the end of next week. But then even when they get there, just to make it more complicated, of course, now we have the coronavirus pandemic. So when the Afghan Islamic Republic delegation gets there from Kabul, they will first be put in quarantine for 14 days. Well, that will enable them to think about what to do. And then the talks will start. And they'll be confronted with very radically different views of what uh, the country should be, well, how this country should be ruled. Uh, as far as I can tell, the Taliban haven't put forward any detailed uh, uh, plans, but uh, they seem to believe that uh, everyone agrees that the government should be Islamic, but they have very different interpretations of that. The Taliban seem to believe that that means it should be run by Islamic clergy or scholars or ulama who determine what the Islamic law is. The Islam Islamic Republic means that it'll be run by the people's elected representatives, but those elected representatives will have to operate within a framework uh, of uh, Islamic law and, and principles and so on. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, the country's desperately poor. It relies on foreign assistance to keep its government running, keep schools and clinics running and so on. So besides trying to uh, legitimate itself with a population that is very divided, the new government will also have to assure that it has good relations with um, the major donors of the international community and its neighbors who are at odds with major donors in the international community uh, so that it can develop. And of course, it's also landlocked, so it will rely on its neighbors for access to the international market. So there's a huge number of over uh, interlocking problems. I'll just say that one thing I've noticed though is that because Afghans have gone through all these experiences for the past 40 years or so, I find that at least they all articulate a determination not to repeat 
the worst of it in the uh, in the past. They don't want the government to collapse, even if they're opponents of the government. They don't want to go back to a civil war. The Taliban say this. The current government says this. So they will both be coming in saying at least that they're committed to finding some kind of a solution. But how they will actually do it, given uh, the a huge range of obstacles that I've outlined, I don't really know. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you for that. Uh, Shamila, would you like to provide some remarks? Sure. Um, I look at this uh, peace deal with the Taliban. Well, I first of all, I wouldn't even call it a peace deal. It's more of an exit um, strategy for America leaving Afghanistan. Um, so for me, when the deal was signed between America and the Taliban, it was uh, very scary and at the same time very emotional. And I'm sure, um, depending where you live in Afghanistan, everyone would um, describe their feeling differently. Uh, but for as a woman um, or as a, who lived under the Taliban regime and witnessed their um, uh, crimes and has seen uh, what they have done to the Afghan people for six years when they were in charge. Um, as a young girl, I was, you know, deprived of my basic rights. Um, uh, they stole six years of my school. Um, so there is a lot, the range of things that they did to Afghan people, not only me, what happened to Afghan people is not something that people can just forget about and um, wanted to, you know, make peace with the Taliban. But that does not mean we Afghans are not willing to make peace with the Taliban. You, as um, Professor Barney said, the war is much older than me. I was born during the war. I was raised in the war. And, um, you know, the majority of my life, I, I have seen war, conflict, and violence. So my soul aches for peace. We want peace. We want this ongoing conflict to end as soon as possible. Um, we are tired of the conflict. But what is this peace is going to cost uh, women and the minority group? Is this going to cost our freedom? Um, and what does this mean for the ordinary Afghans um, who, you know, been living in the war for the past 40 years? And, you know, depending, like, again, who you're talking, the majority of Afghans, we want peace, but we also are so scared at the same time because the way that the discussion has been going on between the American and um, the Taliban hasn't been very um, satisfactory to us because um, a lot, the, the deal, so I, that's why I said, I don't know if I want to call this a peace deal because it was just between the American and Taliban. Now they, we are, um, you know, giving them legitimacy, uh, but we have been fighting them for 17 years as a terrorist. Now we're giving them legitimacy that we want them to be a part of the government, um, which Afghans will be willing to, I think, work with that, but their idea is still very drastic. They reject the constitution as of now, and they say we have to rewrite it, the constitution that was written by the people who are in the country currently. So these are the things why it becomes very scary for minority groups and women um, when we think about the peace talk with the Taliban. So of course, I'm very happy that as of now, the government is willing to meet with the Taliban. Uh, at the time when the US signed that deal with the Taliban, Afghanistan, govern the government was completely out of it and they were um, not going to cooperate. As of recently, Ashraf Ghani has um, does, uh, identified a delegates that they are willing to talk and uh, see where it goes from there. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for that. Um, so I, I guess uh, this is a, a question that I will pose to both of you. Um, you know, obviously there there is a fundamental disconnect that's that's been present for quite some time, in which the um, government in Kabul uh, is insistent on wanting to ensure. Um, that the state remains a republic. And you have uh, the Taliban continues to insist that the state be ruled by their definition of um, Islamic law. So I guess that the question is, you know, wh what are possible outcomes of this process? Um, is there 
a sense of, is there a, sh a shared sense of what a potential agreement could look like, or is it too early to really project that? And secondly, um, what efforts are being made to ensure that uh, women and um, ethnic minorities are, are represented in this conversation uh, and what is being done to try to protect their rights as this process advances. Um, so I guess the, the first question, Barney, I'd, I'd pose to you, what, what does a potential peace agreement look like or what are the range of potential peace agreements? Oh, you're, you're muted, sorry. Both sides have agreed on a certain set of principles. That is, uh, both sides agree that the government has to conform to Islamic law. The question is, how is it applied? And who gets to decide how it, how it is applied? Both sides agree that they want an Afghanistan where there are no foreign troops present. Uh, they, uh, and they have disagreed over what are the conditions under which the foreign troops should withdraw. Um, yeah, they have agreed on a few other basic principles as well. Uh, I think the, uh, you know, I don't know where it will come out. One of the experience of peace processes around the world is that a real peace process is not a process of compromise where you get one side gets, where you get halfway between the two sides. In a genuine peace process, the two sides sit down and figure out how to solve their problems together and they come up with something that they hadn't thought of before, or that, that, some, that is something different. And that's why I, 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 would, I, can, I can come up with scenarios, but I don't think they're worth much because what will really be important is the way the, way the relationships develop. Now, what's uh, interesting about the inclusion of groups is that the, of course, the Taliban group uh, delegation is not particularly inclusive. They're all Taliban. It does include a few non-Pashtuns, members of other ethnic groups, but it doesn't include any women, and uh, they're all Taliban. On the other side, the government has put together a, a re quite reasonably diverse group, members of all ethnic groups. I think uh, maybe uh, almost a third of the members of the delegation are women, six out of 21. Um, and they're se very senior women, uh, you know, with, with a lot of political experience. Um, and they from there. Uh, they are also from different ethnic groups, and there is a number of young people, people from Shamila's generation, who are also on uh, on there with a different kind of education than the Taliban had. So, in the course of the process, the uh, first the, both the people on the government side will have to interact with the Taliban in a way that they haven't before, and to some extent, uh, they'll you know they'll inevitably become humanized just by talking to them, but also the Taliban will have to interact with a much broader variety of Afghans than they are accustomed to and have to take into account uh, that uh, there really are very different perspectives because one problem in a divided society such as Afghanistan is that uh, you'll find many people, almost everyone says that everyone in the country agrees with them because all the people they know do agree with them, and they don't really interact across lines very much. So uh, this will, it could be a, a, a very momentous process, but it will take some time. Um, I'm very happy that, um, to hear that some women uh, have been included in this um, uh, delegates, but I'm not sure, um, to what extent they will be, um, you know, engaging in the peace process with the Taliban? Because even um, during the first round, uh, there were a few women who were included, and they were, um, you know, given a notice very last minute without any consultation, um, and, uh, you know, um, uh, conference or meetings to kind of get other women together or whether we communicate and during this peace talk with the Taliban. So, um, so I was not very satisfied with the first round and a lot of women would say that. And even in this round, the woman that has been included is very senior, highly educated, but I really hope Taliban are willing to sit face to face with them and have um, discussion about the future of Afghanistan because 
you know, um, a lot of the statesmen that Taliban have so far made is uh, saying that, yeah, we want women to uh, get education, go to school, and um, be active based on the Sharia law or, or work based on the Sharia law. Um, so, and I don't know what that means because anyone can interpret that a different way. And for Afghan women, honestly, that is um, very scary because um, we have seen who they are and even co continue to see today a lot of the part of the country that is still heavily controlled by the Taliban, women are still um, stoned to death. They are actually um, killed for running away or for more crimes while men are praised. Uh, women, men are still, even men are still uh, punished for um, listening to music. Um, so uh, that's why when we talk about the peace act, again, as I mentioned, um, it, it, based on where people grew up in the country and what their economic situation has been and opportunities for the past 40 years, they would have a very um, different opinion of the Taliban. But the from what I understand, majority of Afghans, we don't want to uh, have Taliban back because of our experience, but we are willing to meet with them to see what they have to say, specifically about women and minority rights, because minority groups, because they have been the target of Taliban from day one, and even still continue um, to be the target, especially for minority groups. So. It, uh, I would be very interested to see um, how the discussion leads. And also, as Professor Barney said, I think this peace negotiation is very important because you can have an agreement in place, but not both sides really follow the agreements. Like, peace is not something that when you sign an agreement, it comes. Are they both sides really willing to implement this for the sake of their country? You know? And also, are, are Taliban able to articulate? Um, their ideology in a way that is needing people is, um, you know, that people are comfortable with in Afghanistan like that. For the past 18 years, women have achieved a lot. Like you cannot look, um, you know, away from that. So are they willing to work with the current generation uh, of Afghans or are they still gonna have some of their ideology from the past? Because a lot of people say, hey, they have changed. They wanna be accepted in the government. That this is good to reduce violence, but then again, you can reduce violence. And people still be living um, under a regime that doesn't allow them to do a lot of things. Are we still gonna have pr uh, freedom of press? Are women still be able to serve in the army? Are women still gonna be able to sing? and uh, be an athlete, participate uh, in a sport, play soccer. These are all questions that needs to be discussed with the Taliban. What, what do they mean by, um, you know, the Sharia law? Like, uh, what is your um, um, description of that? What exactly, they, how they have envisioned women being a part of the Afghan government? I think that is something that I like to uh, know more about because they haven't been able to articulate very much and they are not very good at um, knowing that Afghan women are so sensitive, minority groups are so against them. They have not been able to give us anything that make us more comfortable coming to the table knowing that they are willing to work with us. Well, so Shamila, to that point, um, the, the people that you're currently talking to, how much confidence is there in the negotiating team as it currently stands to sort of hold the line on these issues? Um, and what is the general perception of, of the process? I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm sure it's a, a mixture of, you know, a general fatigue um, as this conflict is extended, but also as you've articulated fear about what comes next. What, what's, that, what's that conversation been like? To be honest, the list of delegates, as I was looking at um, yesterday, is uh, pretty good for women, especially. I think my, and I know that this women is women are ready. They have we have been organizing meetings all over the country, even in villages, to kind of hear what the women in rural area wants, what the women in city wants, and um, there has been um, a lot of articles uh, written and draft of different 
um, you know, different draft of um, kind of agreements within Afghan women, like what we want, what we want to communicate. So we have a very strong position. We know what we want, most of the women in Afghanistan. Uh, but we not, but I'm also a little nervous from even our own government side, despite having these powerful women in place. I'm not sure how much of their voice will be considered during this process, just because I feel like um, this is, it's a culture uh, in Afghanistan where um, they always tell women, you have the right to education, you can get certain jobs, and you should be okay with that. You should be okay with the basic, basically. When you ask for uh, equality or things that is a little outside uh, what has been already um, there for you, when you go, um, when, when you are going above those limits, that's when they kind of sideline women and says, okay, that's too much. You should be okay with the basics. So for me, I worry that, okay, Taliban are going to be like, women can do certain things. And then we will be pushed aside saying, hey, that's good enough for now. We need to think about reducing violence. So let's just not think too much about you know, what other things matters for women, because it has historically happened to women of Afghanistan before. We have been always used as, you know, our rights has been sacrificed for the good of the country or national security. Um, so, Barney, this has I know, been a sort of an evergreen question um, over the last decade, uh, but to what degree, um, should we take recent reports about a splintering of the Taliban seriously? Uh, do you feel, based on what you know, uh, that the team that is currently in Doha is positioned to really be able to guide a reduction in violence if uh, a real substantive process plays out? Or, or do you think that there is a genuine risk of a further splintering of the organization that makes negotiations more difficult? I have the impression that there's no organization in Afghanistan that is more unified than the Taliban. Uh, of course, all uni organizations in Afghanistan have factions and, uh, and disputes among their leaders, but uh, the Taliban is the only political group in Afghanistan whose members have actually a religious obligation to obey their leader, uh, which they take quite seriously. And the basic principle on which they were established was to overcome the chaos of the civil war by exercising that discipline. As far as the status of the office, it's the, the Taliban leadership has shown that it can reduce violence because it has done it a couple of times when it, when it said so and has uh, implemented it. And it's also shown that it can increase violence. Um, that's not done by Doha. The Doha is the diplomatic arm of the Taliban. Um, so it, it, the leadership is, is still in Pakistan. Um, but the leadership has been shown to have a pretty good control over the uh, over the fighters when it wants to. In addition to which, one of the reasons this has taken so long is that they have devoted a considerable amount of effort to trying to convince their fighters that this, that this agreement is a good idea. I mean, and that's one of the th pieces of evidence that uh, it, it's seriously meant to turn into a peace process. So as of yet, it's not yet a peace process, but it will turn into it, is that uh, the Taliban were very worried that their fighters would be would view it as a sellout uh, and and betrayal. So uh, they have they have been consulting with them, just as you know the the more committed and militant people on every side always are concerned that a peace agreement is going to sell out their interests somehow, or that they will be the losers. So I think they are they are capable of uh, of delivering. What I, do, what I don't know is, again, as I mentioned, just the gap between the two sides is so great. And I've noticed that they seem to place a higher value on keeping their own organization united than on reaching agreements with their opponents. So if there ever gets to a point when it looks like there might be splits, I think they would prefer to keep the war going rather than to divide themselves. Hmm. 
Um, I think I would say I have a very different opinion um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the Taliban keeping Afghanistan peaceful. I don't think making peace with them um, would reduce the violence just because, yeah, maybe there hasn't been as much violence, but even under the current agreement with the U.S., there has been many attacks that Taliban are responsible for the, you know, the recent two attacks were brutal and so many people died, even including the attack on the maternity hospital. So these things actually adds up against the Taliban and people are becoming more and more angry with them. And they even, you know, even if some people were willing to say, oh, I, I'm willing to negotiate with Taliban, when things like this happens, it really make people believe that they, that our ideologies are completely different, that we can never be able to live with them because they are just living on another planet uh, just because of the crimes that they continue to commit. Um, even not only the big explosion, but at the city level, every place that they have control, what they still do to people. And that is scary for women and ordinary people in Afghanistan who does not think about the politics side, who doesn't mm, think about what American and Taliban has discussed. We think, because this deal is gonna directly impact people in Afghanistan who doesn't have you know, the means to leave the country whenever they want. Can I clarify? Oh, sorry. Uh, when I, I of, of the Taliban have reduced violence successfully when they have said they would do it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, they agreed in the agreement with the United States uh, not to, uh, to have a truce with the Americans. They have observed that. They agreed to observe seven day reduction of violence before the signing of the agreement in Doha uh, on February 29th. They did that. Uh, after that, violence increased again because they had not agreed to a reduction in violence. They, did, they declared a, a partial ceasefire over the Islamic holiday, Eid al-Fitr, uh, a few days ago. And since then, again, there has been a reduction of violence, so it's creeping up again. As far as those incidents that Shamila mentioned, the attack on the maternity hospital, uh, according to the United States government, that was not carried out by the Taliban. It was carried out by the Islamic State in Afghanistan, and that's what the Islamic State says as well. The Islamic State has their own uh, their own public affairs office, and they claimed responsibility for that. And we do know who's in the uh, the Islamic State because they've arrested some of the people, and it's not it's not the same people as the Taliban. Uh, there may be some overlap, but what, what one of the reasons, and where Shamila is right, that is that while peace with the Taliban would reduce violence, it certainly would not eliminate it because first of all, you have some more, even more radical groups like the Islamic State. And second, you have uh, a level of criminality, drug trade, uh, armed groups and so on, um, which just will only get worse if the aid decreases and, and people are in greater need. Yeah, but also in Afghanistan, the, a lot of people, um, they don't think um, they don't have that level of understanding that, oh, this wasn't an attack carried by the Taliban, it is the Islamic State. P because there have been, you know, Taliban, Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, they all, all used to be the same, whatever, that's what, at least that, that's what Afghan ordinary the Afghan things responsible for it. And it's actually hard for public people to always know, oh wait, Taliban won peace for, uh, with us, so this is not them, it's the other bad guys. You know, like, um, it's kind of hard to differentiate this. Well, the Taliban are still waging war. Mm -hmm. They didn't attack the maternity war. But of course, that's true in a, in a war situation, especially, mm -hmm. remember, 42 years of war. Mm -hmm. uh, so people have a huge amounts of fear, trauma, Mm -hmm. You know, people in exactly. Afghanistan have suffered from terrible trauma, uh, PTSD, and mistrust. So uh, it will take a long time to get over all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So related to a, a comment that was made a, a bit ago, um, obviously th there's a consensus on both sides about wanting to withdraw U.S. troops ultimately from Afghan soil. There also seems to be consensus that both sides would like to see U.S. Um, economic support 
continue um, to the country. If you were in a position to advise um, the, the president at this moment, what, what is the role that, that the United States uh, could play to be most constructive at this moment? You know, obviously we are withdrawing our troops um, as we speak. Is there anything that we should be doing? Should we be trying to, to get out of the way? Like what, what is the most effective um, point of engagement we have at this time? And I'll I guess, start with Barney on that one. Well, I really do not wish to advise President Trump on anything, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I think the issue right now within the government at his level, issue at his level is, uh, I, as far as I understand, and I don't have any direct access to him, but President Trump really doesn't care about the peace process. He, mm -hmm. he just wants to withdraw the American troops, and he wants to withdraw them before the election. Um, and I think that I'm not uh, uh, that to just withdraw them without regard for the peace process would be a mistake, because the way the agreement is supposed to be structured, it says on the agreement that all the parts of it are interrelated. That means the withdrawal of troops, the guarantees against terrorism by the Taliban, the political settlement, and a complete ceasefire. They're all interrelated. So, if the negotiations do not advance seriously. Uh, toward a political settlement, mm -hmm. then the United States, in my opinion, should pause its troop withdrawal in order to make sure that the, all those parts of the agreement are implemented together. Uh, I don't think President uh, Trump is inclined to do that from what I have heard, uh, but he is receiving warnings, of course, that if he, if he just withdraws without the political settlement, uh, various terrible things might happen, which would look bad for him in the elections, which perhaps is the only thing he cares about. Yeah, I, I would say that it would be a huge mistake if um, America just says, hey, this is not our problem. Uh, we, you know, been fighting the terrorist group for 17 years or 18, 20 years. Now it's Afghan's problem because when America first came to Afghanistan, not because they want to free the Afghans from the Taliban regime, but because they were chasing a terrorist and Al Qaeda because of 9-11. Because if that was the intention to free Afghans and give them freedom, they would have come before 9-11. So with that, you can't just leave a country in the middle of the peace negotiation and say, deal with a terrorist group that now we are legitimizing and saying that you should work with them. So they have to uh, remain throughout the process to make sure, you know, that Taliban are really, uh, they have the intention of making peace and they have the... Uh, and same thing with the Afghan government, that we are willing to accept them as a party, but we are not willing to make all these drastic changes that they want to have to govern the country. You know, being uh, accepted as a political party to have some power and be, you know, have some seat at the parliament is one thing, but to say, let's rewrite the constitution and let's change Afghanistan name to uh, Islamic State Emirates, whatever, that is a conversation that Afghans will never be willing to you know, even have it with the Taliban. So I just want to remind everyone that if you'd like to submit questions, um, you can go to the Q&A box down there at the bottom of your screen um, and type them in. So uh, the first question I have here is from uh, James Prince. And, you know, we've been talking a lot about the negotiation process, but if a agreement is reached, um, obviously implementation is going to be a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. Getting public buy-in is going to be a huge challenge. Um, what What is the process look like right now and what steps are being taken to build public support for this process and a eventual deal? You mean in Afghanistan? In Afghanistan, I believe. Well, the government held what they call a loy jerga, a big assembly, where they had an extensive public debate about it. They do have free media in Afghanistan, and people are talking about it uh, quite a bit. They're expressing mm -hmm. their fears and their hopes uh, quite, quite uh, openly, <laughs> I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, that once the negotiations start, I expect them, of course, there'll have to be parts of them that are confidential, but I expect them to be relatively transparent. So um, I, I'm not really that, uh, I, I don't think that is really a problem. The, 
the problem will be there is a danger, of course, because all the one one problem is that all the people on the Islamic Republic side do not agree with each other. Actually, there are two main factions within that group uh, who are always at odds about different issues about how the government should be structured and so on. Um, and it's possible that in the course of the negotiation with the Taliban, they might fragment, uh, you know, start negotiating separately with it. You know, but I don't want to speculate about that. I think they're determined not to do that. Um, so the uh, and if if there isn't uh, enough of a consensus, it won't be possible to implement it because, as I said, the the government in Afghanistan is still very weak. Mm -hmm. It it cannot control the people by force, uh, and. If also, I should say, if any of the neighboring countries are unhappy about it, it's very easy for them with very little money to disrupt it, to just pay some people to fight, as they've been doing now for 40 years. So uh, we, it, it can't be implemented if it doesn't have a solid base of support, both inside and outside the country. I agree. I think um, uh, there has been a lot of meetings within Afghanistan, um, different civil society. There has been a lot of um, uh, discussion from expert human rights activists um, on TV. There has been many discussions about what then, what is the peace deal with the Taliban mean for Afghan, not only in Kabul or big cities, but actually um, in rural areas, what that means for women and for the people. Um, and I think the, a lot of this discussion has started to really, because, you know, Afghan people are, um, you know, have um, been traumatized for the four years of war, especially during the Taliban. So there, everyone has lost someone from their within family, immediate family to this war. Even like I lost a cousin a few weeks ago um, because of a Taliban attack. And, and he left behind a wife and two children. So we have to really make sure that people who lost families, who suffered directly um, from the Taliban are willing to overcome this pain and be willing to make peace with them. And I, th I would say there are a lot of them who would do it, but this has to be done properly. Through our, our government is responsible to ensure that our people are willing to put our pains away, knowing that they were brutal, that they have done these things to us, but because they are also Afghan, they want to be a part of Afghanistan, we have to accept them to ensure, but make sure this will never happen again. Like, there was a woman from Kandahar village lost three sons, has now taken care of more than 40 grandsons alone. Like, so how do we make sure that that mother is okay, you know, with our government making peace with a group of, um, you know, with the Taliban who took three of his son. Like, this is not gonna be easy for our people to accept. And as Professor Bonnie said, I think there is a lot of discussion needs to happen because depending on who you're talking, there's very drastic view of the Taliban. Some people say, hey, maybe we can make peace with them, but there are people like me and my family, that we do not think they are capable of living with Afghans and they will ever agree with, um, you know, the, the the values of the Afghan people or my family, for example. Is you know, as a woman, one of seven women who lived under the Taliban, who was not able to leave the house without being escorted by my father is something that I will never forget. You know, being beaten on the street by the Taliban is not something I will easily forget or forgive, but I have to see what this um, negotiation piece, um, how it is going and how the implementation is going to be the hardest thing, you know, because you have to make sure people are willing to uh, accept them. That's when the actual implementation will begin. From both sides, of course, I'm not saying just Afghans, but Taliban too. How are, are they willing to really, like, like Professor Barney say, are the fighters willing to accept the side of Afghan deal with the Taliban and they're really going to put their weapons down? That's something that we're not going to know. Well, I, I, you know, Shamila, of course, you are talking about your experience, which is with the Taliban. But as you said, <clears throat> the war is older than you are. 
and all the atrocities in this war were not carried out by the Taliban. They, the only reason there is a Taliban is because there were 20 years of atrocities before the Taliban. First, the communist government um, uh, arrested and disappeared as many as 50,000 people. The Soviet Union bombed villages and people estimate as many as a million people might have been killed. Over 3 million people became refugees. Then there was a war in the city. This is before the Taliban, in which the International Committee of the Red Cross estimates 50,000 civilians were killed among fight in fighting among groups that are now part of the Afghan government. And many mm -hmm. people remember that. This is before uh, Shamila was born. She doesn't remember it. But uh, they, many people, or at least before, it's before she became of age to remember it. Uh, but many people remember that as the worst time. Uh, I think your family went to the village at that time rather than stay in Kabul when there was all, all that fighting going on. And that's why some people welcomed the Taliban at first because uh, they stopped that fighting, but then they became oppressive in their own way. Uh, and uh, But then, of course, there's a sector of the population um, that has suffered under the United States and this government uh, from being bombing, uh, the Taliban being sent to Guantanamo and, and, and so on. So really, uh, there's no group, on, there's no one on any side of the war that has not been a victim. There's not, victims are not one group. Everybody mm -hmm. has been a victim, even including the perpetrators. They have also been victims. And that's going to be a very complicated thing to deal with. So we got a, a couple questions related to the roles other countries in the region are playing in all this. Um, and obviously that's a incredibly complicated conversation in its own right. Uh, but specifically, what role do you all anticipate um, Iran and the Saudis playing in this? And also, are there um, other countries that are now working unilaterally with the Taliban on deals separate from the peace process, related to trade development, things like that? Um, is there anybody who would actually prefer to see the Taliban play a larger role um, in, the out, the, in the eventual government that emerges from this uh, than, say, the United States? Well, I think it's important to bear in mind that uh, the Taliban are not the only issue in Afghanistan, especially for the neighboring countries. Most of them, they don't want the Taliban to take power, but they don't want the United States of military bases there either. Because really, in the long run, uh, if you are on the other side from the United States, the United States is a more serious threat than the Taliban. Certainly, that is how Iran looks at it. Uh, that is potentially how Russia might look at it. China does not look at it that way right now. Pakistan is ambivalent. So they all have an, a very strong interest in getting the United States troops out of there. And that is the reason that some of them, I, I accept Pakistan is different, but that some of them like Russia and Iran have uh, given some very limited assistance to the Taliban uh, to guard their borders or to put pressure on the United States. Pakistan is a different situation. They have had a strategic investment in the Taliban for many years for reasons we don't have time to discuss right now. Um, but they also suffered from their own Taliban a great deal in the last few years. Um, and they're under some pressure from China uh, to come to terms. We will see how, how they will behave. Um, but uh, and, and then bear in mind, the whole context is different than it was 20 years ago because the economy of China has taken off, the economy of India has taken off, and that means there are much stronger economic interests in the region and stability than there were before. I don't know whether they'll be able to make that a reality, but that is something that didn't exist a couple decades ago. Um, and then another question sort of about Afghanistan's future. Um, what would a economically strong Afghanistan look like? I mean, there's been lots of talk of uh, mineral deposits, of it being a transit route. Um, how viable are plans for um, sort of a self-sufficient uh, Afghan government, and Afghan state? Um, that would be a very difficult, um it's a very complicated and difficult to think about Afghanistan's economic instability because, um, you know, the way Afghanistan is a landlocked country, it will be very hard for Afghanistan to be economically, you, you know, independent because the neighboring countries that Professor Barney named, all of them will ensure that Afghanistan does not become economically independent and strong 
because it will not benefit them. So the way that Afghanistan is right now, where it is this 40 years war, it's not just because Afghans doesn't get along with each other. It's because the you know, neighboring countries, they ensure that Afghan doesn't get along with each other and continue this ongoing conflict because it will benefit them. Pakistan plays an important role around every single country in the region are interested in Afghanistan for a reason. I really don't have the expertise to talk about it. I'm not really sure Afghanistan does have a lot of minerals, but because it's certain areas are so unsafe, reaching that is really hard and it's controlled by certain group of people. So I really don't, can't talk more about that, how that's going to look like um, in the future. Barney, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, um, you know, the may, Afghanistan is a landlocked country. That uh, it, it does, it would, means that uh, outsiders can, except for the countries that have a immediate border with it. There are six of them. Um, no other country can get into Af can get to Afghanistan or citizens into Afghanistan except by going over the land or through the airspace of one of those six countries. That's Iran, and especially Iran and Pakistan control by far the largest part of the border. Central Asia is very important, uh, but uh, Central Asia is also landlocked. And uh, it, it, to get to Central Asia, you have to go through Russia or China. Um, so Afghan and Afghanistan can't develop economically unless it has economic cooperation with its neighbors. If it has economic cooperation with one neighbor, which is opposed by another neighbor, then it will still be caught in conflict. In a way, it has to have at least not bad relations with all of its neighbors at the same time. Now, what the positive element elements are that, as I, I mentioned, the economies of China and India have taken off, which means there are two very large expanding markets close to Afghanistan, if it could actually get access to them and be stable enough to take advantage of that. Uh, but of course, India and China also do not get along, are increasingly in conflict. Um, and the routes by which Afghanistan can trade with uh, either India or China are rather complicated. I won't go into them here. We don't have a map to, to talk about it. but. Um, but that's why it, Afghanistan's economic well-being is intimately connected to its foreign policy. Well, thank you all both so much uh, for taking the time to chat with us today. Um, this has been very enlightening, and I imagine this is going to be um, a topic that we'll be able to... Oh, sorry, my internet is being unstable. Uh, but this is, this is a topic we're going to be able to return to a number of times over the course of the months ahead. So I look forward to being in touch with uh, both of you and continuing this conversation. Um, but uh, with that, I will hand it over to Mariah. Yes, thanks everyone so much. Um, thank you, Shamila, Barney, and Thomas for sharing your time and expertise with us during this um, discussion. And thank you to all of our members and guests for joining us. Um, we have a lot of great programming coming up and I encourage you to join us on Thursday at 11.30 a.m. for an off the record discussion with a State Department official on US policy towards Venezuela. Um, and you can go to our website at pacificcouncil.org to sign up. And as some final notes, we really appreciate your support during this time. And if you're able to provide any additional support, you can donate to our work at pacificcouncil.org slash donate. And we have a new Facebook, um, Pacific Council Facebook group that we're starting. So please check out your inbox for an invite and join our community there. So stay safe and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks to Thank the Pacific you. Council. Yeah.